Ephesians 1, starting in verse number 7. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him, who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Father, thank You for this uh, precious book, the precious truths contained in this book. And as we talked about this morning, thank You for willingly go to, going to that cross. Lord, if You didn't pay the redemption price for our, for our souls, nobody else could have done it. You're the only one that could have done it, and we thank You that You chose to do it because of Your great love, Your mercy, and Your grace towards us. And um, please give us wisdom and understanding according to your words uh, in, in the passage we have here before us tonight and uh, help us to be encouraged and helped by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in verse number 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The Bible says we have the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness is an act of mercy where the offended party chooses to forego the infliction of judgment or punishment, though it is in his power to execute it. I'll say that one more time. It, forgiveness, it's an act of mercy where the offended party chooses to forego the infliction of judgment or punishment though it is in His power to execute it. Now, forgiveness is different than justification. Justification means declared righteous. Forgiveness, you forgiving someone, that's not you declaring them righteous. God forgives someone, that's not declaring them righteous. That's just not executing the judgment that they deserved. Now, praise the Lord, when the Lord saved us, we also got justification. But forgiveness and justification, two different things. And uh, I can, if you sin against me, I can forgive you. I, can, uh, I cannot justify you. I cannot tell you what you did was right. I cannot declare you righteous, but I can forgive you. But the Bible says we have forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And if you're not in Jesus Christ, verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're not in Christ, and therefore He will not forego the punishment uh, that, that you deserved. Um, we, when the Lord forgave us, He, for, he foregone, foregoed the punishment of our sins, and that's eternal punishment in the lake of fire, hellfire. That's what we got for forgiveness of sins. Praise the Lord for that. And it's according to the riches of His grace. Thank God He wanted to forgive us. Thank God He had a desire to forgive us. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 50. Let's look at the first time forgiveness is found in the Bible. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, uh, Jacob has died, and uh, all of Joseph's brethren has come down into Egypt, and um, his, his brethren are concerned because although Joseph has not uh, he's forgiven them up to this point. Now their father is dead, and now they're worried. Uh, we, we want, now they're worried that Joseph's going to 
uh, give them what they rightfully had coming now, now that their father is dead. Genesis 50, verse number 12. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, which he, he didn't, but <laughs> it's conveniently that they uh, forget, forgot to mention that part while he was alive. But Verse 17, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept, when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for me, ye thought evil against me, God, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now, here's the first place in all the Bible that you find forgiveness. You find that word forgive it's right here in Genesis chapter 50. And it's Joseph's brethren asking forgiveness for what they did to him. Joseph's brethren hated him without a cause. They had no reason to hate him other than their own envy. They hated him without a cause. They threw him in a pit. They would have killed him if it wasn't for Reuben holding him back. They would have killed him. They sold him into the uh, hands of of uh, Midianites to be brought into, uh, into Egypt as a slave. They had no right to ask for forgiveness. They didn't deserve his forgiveness. Even when they're asking forgiveness, they're lying to him. They said, Jacob said this before he died. No, he didn't. He made that up. That never came out <laughs> while Jacob was alive. And they're, they're most unworthy of Joseph's forgiveness and how that pictures our forgiveness from God. We had no right to ask God for forgiveness. We had no basis on which to ask for forgiveness. There was no reason for him to forgive us other than he wanted to and he loved us and he chose to do it because he's rich in grace. And then after he forgives them, what does he do? He nourishes them and he comforts them and he speaks kindly unto them. Aren't you glad that you ever, you ever, you ever go to someone forgiveness Ask for forgiveness, and they say, yeah, I forgive you. <laughs> and maybe technically they did, but their, their conduct and their behavior from then on out, you would never know it. And there's no comfort there, and there's no kindness there. And okay, maybe they did forgive you, technically speaking, but it's completely, the relationship's completely changed after that. And aren't you glad that the Lord didn't say, okay, I forgive you, and then just... <laughs> leave you on your own to suffer the consequences, leave you on your own to, to get struggle through life. I'm forgiving you, but I'm not helping you from here on out after all you've done. No, praise the Lord. He comforts us and he nourishes us and he speaks kindly unto us despite everything we've done. And that's forgiveness. First time you find that it shows up in the Bible. Now, let's look at the second time forgiveness shows up in the Bible. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat uh, every herb of the land, even all the hail that hath left. Uh, the hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there was no such locust as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every green herb, every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt." 
Then uh, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh continues his rebellion after this, but in this instance, he got the forgiveness that he was asking for. The judgment was stayed, the punishment was stopped, and Pharaoh, at least this one time, that's what he said, this once, that's what he asked for, that's what the Lord gave him, forgave him for that time and that moment. Now again, as we saw with the first case, how unworthy and how undeserving is Pharaoh of forgiveness? I mean, he has, he has brought these Israelites into cruel bondage, plague after plague after plague, and he, he keeps on uh, 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 bringing them into bondage. He won't let them go. He won't let them go. And here he is. He's finally fed up with what's going on. And he says, please, please forgive me. And in this, for this instance, that's what he got. He got forgiveness. He got forgiveness. And w- again, what is forgiveness? It's, where, it's an act of mercy where the offended party chooses to forego the infliction of judgment or punishment. And that's what the Lord did. He stopped the plague at that moment. He, he, Pharaoh got the forgiveness for this instance that he got. Now again, just like the first example, what a great picture of our forgiveness And how undeserving we were when we asked the Lord to save us. How many times we had sinned against the Lord, despite His commandments, despite His warnings. Sin, 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 sin. And the moment you asked the Lord to forgive you, just like that. He forgave you just like that. He didn't say, now wait a minute. This is, going to take a, this is going to take some time. After all you've done, after the way you've lived, this is, not, this is not instant forgiveness just like that, but it was. It was. The very moment you got saved, the Lord forgave you of a lifetime of sin, however long that life was. And we see in these first two examples of forgiveness in the Bible, the person asking for forgiveness was completely unworthy of that forgiveness, but yet they got it. And in Ephesians 1, 7, the Bible says we have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. God forgave us because He's rich in grace. Praise the Lord. Let's look at the third time forgiveness shows up in the Bible. Go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Exodus 32, verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of, of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. See, it's very, they're very modern, earrings in the, in the ears of the sons, not just the daughters. It's very, very modern. Uh, Verse 3, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. That's also very modern. Just do whatever you want to do, sin in whatever way you want to sin, and claim you're worshiping the Lord and everything's right with you and God. Verse 6, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now, skip to verse number 19 for, for time's sake. Verse number 19, Moses comes down uh, from the mountain and he sees what's going on and... Well, as you can imagine, she's not too happy about it. Verse number 19, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder. And then he, 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 he asked Aaron what happened, and Aaron says, Well, I just threw it in the fire and the, magically this calf came out. <laughs> 
I always laugh every time I read that. Um, but uh, skip, to verse, uh, skip to verse 30. It says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now therefore, uh, therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will uh, visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they had made the calf which Aaron made. Now, third example of forgiveness in your Bible, they, they, the forgiveness was not granted. The Lord in verse 35 uh, plagued the people. He gave them what they got coming. That's different than the first two examples. First two examples, Joseph's brethren come and ask for forgiveness, and as undeserving as they were, they got it. Pharaoh, can you get any more undeserving of forgiveness than Pharaoh? But Pharaoh received that forgiveness. Here in Exodus 32, Israel, they don't get the forgiveness. But what's different about this situation? In this situation, Moses saying, Moses told them, you have sinned a great sin. They didn't say they sinned a great sin. That was Moses telling them they sinned a great, they sinned a great sin. In verse 32, it says, yet now if, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. You know what the difference in this example is than the prior two examples? Moses is asking for forgiveness for the people. The, for, the people aren't asking for forgiveness. And Moses, you know what he even, he, he even offers to give his life, if that's what it takes for God to forgive this people. That's how much Moses loves Israel. That's how, Moses loves the, how much he loves the people. He offers to tell the Lord, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. Take me instead of them if that's what it takes to forgive them. And yet for all that love of Moses on Moses' part, all that compassion, all that grace on Moses' part, they don't get forgiven because they didn't want the forgiveness. He was asking for forgiveness for them, but they, ha they didn't want the forgiveness. They didn't ask for it. And what a great picture. Jesus Christ came down here, loved you so much to die to pay for your sins. He gave up his life so you could be forgiven but if you don't want that forgiveness, then you're not getting it. It doesn't matter if, how much the Lord loves you. It doesn't matter how much He loved you and the fact that He was willing to lay down His life for you. If you don't want the forgiveness, then you're not getting the forgiveness just because the one that loves you wants you to give you the forgiveness. Now, you don't have to be any more worthy of forgiveness than Joseph's brethren or Pharaoh. It's not about being worthy or deserving. None of us deserve God's forgiveness, but you have to want the forgiveness. Just because somebody else wants you forgiven doesn't mean you're going to get forgiven. You can be the vilest sinner. Paul was the chief of sinners, but you have to want the forgiveness. The fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood and died on the cross so you could be forgiven doesn't mean you are going to be forgiven. You have to want it. And... The children of Israel, Joseph's brethren, completely unworthy of forgiveness. But as unworthy as they were, they wanted and asked for it. And they got it. And Pharaoh, completely unworthy of forgiveness. But as much as he was unworthy, he asked for it and he got it. The children of Israel, they're not any more worthy. They're not any, more, they're not any less worthy. But they didn't ask for it. And they didn't want it and they didn't get it. And God is rich in grace, and He wants to forgive you, but He only forgives people that want the forgiveness. He only, he only forgives people that ask Him for it. Now, if you ask Him for it, He'll forgive you of all your sins. But if you think that just because He died for you, that's good enough, that's not good enough. You have to take the offer that He's offering you. Now, go with me to Luke 17. Luke 17. Luke chapter 17, 
verse number 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. You are not required to forgive someone who doesn't repent. Now you can if you want to. But Lord says, somebody's trespassed against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. God doesn't forgive anyone who doesn't repent. Ephesians 4.32, be kind, tenderhearted, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, God never forgave you of your sins until you repented. Look at verse number 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. That's a little too much for us, Lord. We need, our, we need our faith increased. But here's another point I want you to see about forgiveness. Only the person you've sinned against can forgive you. Right? He says in verse 3, If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. If Steve sins against Dom, I can't, I can't forgive Steve. He'll have to get the forgiveness from Dom. I don't know why thought to do that, but no. no. again, forgiveness. It's an act of mercy where, that, where the offended party chooses to forgo the infliction of judgment or punishment, though it is in his power to execute it. I can't forgive you for someone, something you did to somebody else. You can't forgive me for something I did to somebody else. You got to get forgiveness from the person you sinned against. Now, um, go with me to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse number 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, what do we just see in Luke 17? You've got to get forgiveness from the person you sinned against. Now, what does, the, what does 1 John 3, 4 say? Sin is the transgression of the law. Ultimately, all your sins are against God. You know, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he killed Uriah, her husband, and then he told a bunch of lies about to, to, to Uriah, then he covered up a whole, whole big mess. And then in Psalm 51, he said, he told the Lord in his prayer of repentance, he says, against thee, thee only, have I sinned. How could he say that? How could David say, I've sinned against the Lord, when all his sin was against Uriah and Bathsheba and, and the, nation, the, whole, the entire nation of Israel. How could he say that? Because it was God's law that he broke. God's the one that said, thou shalt not kill. God's the one that said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes, he was sinning against someone else, but ultimately his sin was against God. Ultimately, all your sins, all my sins, ultimately are against God because he's the law that we trans. He wrote the law that we transgressed. He wrote the law that we broke. All our sins are against God. Now, you can, you can buck against that or, or resent that, but think with me. Only the person that you've sinned against can forgive you. So the fact that all your sin is against God is a blessing because there, therefore He can forgive all your sins. Think about it. If you're... <laughs> forgiveness was based on somebody else forgiving you, we'd all be doomed. We'd all be doomed. There's plenty of people out there that you've sinned against in the very slightest way and they won't forgive you. What if you had to get forgiveness from them to have eternal life? What if you had to get their forgiveness to be saved? We'd be lost. What if David had to get forgiveness from Uriah? Well, Uriah's dead too late. That ship sailed. What if he had to get forgiveness from Ahithophel, the grandfather of Bathsheba? Probably not going to happen. Probably not going to happen. But because all our sin is against God, He can forgive all our sins. Praise the Lord. And He is rich in grace. Nobody else in this universe is rich in grace. Not like the Lord, but the Lord is rich in grace. So 
Yes, all our sins against the Lord, and that's the only way we're saved. That's the only way we got forgiven, because he's the only one that would have forgiven us. How many times, how many times have we failed the Lord? How many times have we sinned against the Lord? If we treated anybody else like that, they would never forgive us. But the Lord's rich in grace. He's forgiven us of all our sins. We'll go back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Verse number 8, Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. You know, Job said in Job 25, 4, uh, the Bible says in Job 25, 4, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Good question. Good question. Somebody before Calvary wouldn't necessarily know the answer to that question, but God in His wisdom devised a way whereby we could be clean, whereby we could be saved and justified with God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, well, let's turn there, 1 Corinthians 1. You know, if God, we talked about this morning that God was holy and without blame and love, and that's why, he could, that's why he could go to the cross to pay for our sins. And that's why he was willing to go to the cross to pay for our sins. Because he was both holy and without blame and in love. But if he wasn't wise, well then he never thinks of the plan. To devise a plan that we could, we could be saved. And so Christ, well look at verse 24, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greece... Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. I mean, think about it. We just, we've known it all our lives. We've heard about it all all our lives that God became man. But think about that. That's pretty amazing. That God would devise a plan whereby we could be saved by God becoming man. That's wisdom. That's wisdom, knowing how the only way we could be saved from our sins, the only way we could be redeemed and forgiven, God devising a plan in His wisdom. I like the, what the songwriter said. He said, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. It was His wisdom, wisdom and His love that devised that plan. Look at verse number 30, 1 Corinthians 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. He is our wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. (laughs) So the Lord was the one righteous, we were not. He was the one that loved us, we were not. He was the one that was rich in grace, we were not. He was the wise one, we were not. So where is this, where is any glory left for us in all this? It's all, it all goes to him. Look at chapter 2. Look at verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God's great wisdom in sending Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.8, He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now prudence... Prudence is wisdom practically applied. Um, It discerns the most suitable means to accomplish valuable purposes. It's principally in reference to actions to be done and do means, order, season, and method of doing or not doing. So it's wisdom practically applied. I'll give you the reference. We won't turn there. Isaiah 52, 13. If you want to write it down, Isaiah 52, 13. It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. The Bible says, My servant shall deal prudently. Talking about Jesus Christ. He abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudency. So he applied that wisdom. Not only did he devise the plan whereby we could be saved, he followed through with it. And he did it. Because that was the only means whereby we could be saved. We'll look at verse number 9, Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Well, what is that purpose in himself? What is it? Well, we, we, we've covered it already back to verse 4. 
according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's his purpose. That's what he wants. That's what he's eventually going to do in our lives. And that's what he wants done t- today in our lives to the greatest extent possible. That's his purpose, which he purposed in himself. I'll give you a, a good uh, cross reference for that. Uh, hold your finger here. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 27. The Bible says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Well, verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called, according, watch it, to his purpose. You just read that in Ephesians 1. Now, what is his purpose? Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, you just saw that in Ephesians 1, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's his purpose. You're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Well, what is Jesus Christ like? He's holy and without blame in love. That's his purpose in you, in me. That's what we're going to be one day. That's what he's trying to get to work in us right now, today. Now, go back to Ephesians 1. Now, verses 7 through 12 is all one sentence. So look at end of verse 7 is semicolon, end of verse 8, semicolon, end of verse 9, colon, end of verse 10, colon, end of verse 11, colon, end of verse 12, period. So verses 7 through 12 is all one sentence. It's all connected. It's all related. You can't separate it. So watch this. Verse 9 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now, verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So this, the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, is all in accord with verse 9, his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. And again, that matches verses 3 and 4. What, in other words, what the Lord's saying is, He didn't just redeem you and forgive you so you could say, Praise the Lord, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed. You're supposed to do something with that redemption. Do something with that forgiveness. Use it to be more like Jesus Christ. The Lord's given you a, a clean slate, if you will. He's forgiven you of all your sins. He's brought you out of bondage. Now you're free to serve the Lord. So serve the Lord and be like Him. That's His purpose. Now, Verse number 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, we're going to have to break the flow of this a little bit because I want to cover this phrase, the dispensation of the fullness of times. Okay? He's in that in that dispen, when he dispenses that out, all thing, he's going to gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth. Um, dispensation. Uh, dispensation is not a time period. Okay, I've heard it taught like that a lot. It's a it's a time period. It has a start date. It has an end date. It's not. That's not the definition of the word. Not in the dictionary. Not in the Bible. Not anywhere. Uh, it's a dispensation, think about it, it's a distributing of something as, as supplies. How many of you ever heard of a dispensary? It's a place where supplies are giving out. So God is dispensing something here. He's not dispensing time. He's dispensing the fullness of times. And um, we'll take a look at that in a second. But it, it, it kicks off or begins what you could classify maybe as a time period, but a dispensation is not a time period. Now, the dispensation of the fullness of times, hold your finger here, go to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, 11. Bible says, I say then, 
Have they stumbled that they should fall? It's talking about Israel. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So, Israel, through their fall, salvations come unto the Gentiles. In other words, Israel, unto Israel were committed the oracles of God. They were the people that God spoke to in the Old Testament. They had the scriptures. Well, through their fall, <laughs> praise the Lord, salvation come unto the Gentiles. But it says in verse 12, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. In other words, when Israel re is restored... In their, in their fullness, well, it's not that the Gentiles go back down. We're even better for that, right? Now, look at verse number 25, Romans eleven twenty-five. 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So right now we are in a um, we are in the the uh, church age, if you will, and one day the fullness of the Gentiles become will be come in, and that's when the Lord takes us out of here. That's the rapture of the church, and what what then happens? The Lord begins to turn to His dealings with the nation of Israel once again. But what did verse twelve say? When the fullness of Israel's come in. How much more the riches of the Gentiles. In other words, when Israel's restored, everybody's better for it, not just Israel. Now, look at verse number 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that's Jew and Gentile, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. All right, now, here's the conclusion. We just read verses 32 to ver verse 36. We just read the conclusion of the matter of the fullness of Israel, the fullness of the Gentiles. Israel's restored, right? Now, hold your finger here and look at Ephesians 1. I want you to, we're going to compare these things. We're going to compare these, this passage here. Verse number, Romans 11, verse number 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein... He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. You see that? The, Ephesians 1, the riches of His grace, wherein, wherein that riches of His grace, He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. Romans eleven thirty three. 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, look at verse number 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been His counselor? Now look at Ephesians 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things, after the counsel of His own will. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 11 says, The Lord works all things after the counsel of His own will. Romans eleven thirty four. Who hath been His counselor? Look at verse number 36. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things... Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Go back to Romans 11.36. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Ephesians 1.12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Now, you put the two passages together, the dispensation of the fullness of times, that is when God dispenses out not just the fullness of Israel, not just the fullness of the Gentiles, 
but the fullness of all of them. The fullness of times that matches if, uh, Romans 11. That's when Israel is restored. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And think about it, folks. We have family in heaven and we have family in earth. When are we gathered together? <laughs> when the Lord comes back. When he comes for us, yes. And then when is, when is this dispensation, when does he dispense the fullness of times? When he comes back to the earth. Now, look at verse 10 again, Ephesians 1.10. Excuse me, verse 9. Look at verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now, so far we've seen uh, verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That has to do with our relationship to God. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That has to do with uh, our relationship to God. Uh, up, till, up till this point, all these things that the Lord's talking about has to do with our relationship to God. But verse number 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. You know what that is? That's the restoration of all our brothers and sisters in Christ, the, re the restoration of our relationship with our family. So when the Lord gets back and we, we no longer have the sin anymore, the dispensation of the fullness of times, not only are, is our relationship with our Father perfectly restored, our relationship with our family in Christ, is perfectly restored. All things in Christ, heaven and earth, we have family in heaven right now, we have family in earth, all gathered together in that time, and our relationship together is perfectly restored. Now, think about all the strained relationships over the years you've been saved, of uh, brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. You know, one of the great things about heaven is all those things will one day be restored not only will they be restored, they will be better than they have ever been before. Think about any falling out you've ever had with a brother in Christ. Any, any falling out you've ever had with a sister. Anybody, anybody who, who's saved, who's your brother and sister in Christ, one day, one day, that relationship will be better than it's ever been before. And it's like the problems were never even there. Praise the Lord for that. Now, this matches... This message, this mass, I'll show you this isn't a private interpretation. This matches the theme, one of the themes of the books, and the theme of the book, one of the themes is unity. Look at Ephesians 2, verse number 14. For he is our peace, who hath, broken, who hath made both one, that's Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And you read the rest of chapter 2, and what did the Lord do? He brought Jew and Gentile together in Jesus Christ. No more enmity, no more strife. They're one in Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 3, verse number 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me, by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am the less, less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Watch this verse 11 according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, Jews and Gentiles, one in Jesus Christ, that is in accord with the, etern with the eternal purpose. What's the eternal purpose? We've already seen it several times. We're just like Jesus Christ, holy, without blame before him in love, but not just me, not just you, all of us. Restored together. Now look at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There it is again. We got fa right now we have family in heaven and we have family in earth. Ephesians 1.10, 
all that family together, together forever, perfect unity. Now, the, the theme follows through. Look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse number 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's what we're trying to do right now. <laughs> we are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Everybody who's, who has the Holy Spirit, everybody who's been saved, we should be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Well, verse number 13, one day it's going to happen. Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So one day, right right now, today, we are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. One day, future, we will all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We are trying to do right now what will be done in the future. And that's, we've seen that time and time again in the book of Ephesians, is that the Lord's going to make us holy, He's going to make us righteous, He's going to make us like Jesus Christ, and that's what we should be working on right now. That's what we should be trying to go after right now. Now look at, um, go to 1 Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, look at verse 17. Then we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up together with them. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. The ra- what we call the, the word, I don't have a problem using the word rapture, but the word rapture is not in the Bible Right here in 2 Thessalonians 2.1, it's called our gathering together unto him. That's what it is. Ephesians 1.10, the Lord's going to gather all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. Now, when we read 1 Thessalonians 4 about those that have gone on before us, they've died, we don't sorrow as those that have no hope, usually we think, well, okay, maybe you're... Maybe you're a lot more spiritual than I am. Usually I think, praise the Lord, I get to see the people that I love down here and that I got along with down here. I get to see them again. Usually all the other people maybe don't come to mind as much. But the great thing about the Lord gathering us all, you're not going to just be restored with the people you love down here or the people you had a great relationship with down here. You're going to be restored to everybody Who's your family in Christ? <laughs> and hopefully that means something to you here. It'll definitely mean something to you up there when the Lord brings us all back. But go back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, I gave the example before, but I'll give it again about this. We already covered predestination in detail. We won't do that again. But predestination. There's a plane going from Hartford to Atlanta. You have the choice to get on that plane. You don't have to get on that plane. It's completely up to you. It's voluntarily. But once you get on that plane, your destination is predetermined. Once you get on that plane, you're going to Atlanta. That's where the plane is going. You don't have to wonder about your destination. You're going to Atlanta. So everybody that got to Atlanta, they got there voluntarily, and they got there by predestination. Their destination was predetermined, and they got there because they wanted to go there. Now, you don't have to trust Christ. That's your free will that God's given you. But once you trust Christ... It is predetermined that you are going to be just like Christ. You are going to be holy and without blame, just like Jesus Christ. So the the predestination is not saved or not. The predestination is for saved people. It says being predestinated according to the purpose. Now you already know what that purpose is. We don't have to say that again. It's in accord with the purpose of Him who worketh all things after after the counsel of those own will, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now, when sinners like you and I 
are made absolutely perfect and righteous and just like Jesus Christ, who is going to be glorified? Not us. It's the Lord for having done that. And the Lord's going to be glorified when we're on display, if you will, that the Lord could take people like you and I and make us just like Jesus Christ, completely holy and righteous. Now, again, verses 7 to 12 is, is one sentence, so kind of just look through it and hit the highlights. Verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Verse 9, uh, uh, he, he made known unto us the mystery of his will. Verse 10, he's going to gather all, to, all everybody in Christ, all things in Christ, heaven and earth, all gathered together. Verse 11, uh, we have an inheritance predestinated to be just like Jesus Christ. Verse 12, and when that happens, God will be glorified. So that's, that's verses 7 to 12. Now, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, in this verse, in verse 13, Holy Spirit is not his title. Not in this verse. That holy is a, is a lower cast, lowercase h, is it not, in your Bible? So it's not Holy Spirit, like that's his name in, in, this, in this verse. It's an adjective describing the Spirit. The Spirit is holy. He is a Holy Spirit. Now, if you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, and the Holy Spirit of promise is the earnest of our inheritance, that's the down payment... <laughs> then what's the complete payment? Perfect holiness and perfect righteousness. Look, the inheritance can't be money because you've already got the down payment, and when you got the down payment, you didn't get any more money. You already, right? The, verse 14 says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The day you got saved, you didn't get any richer for it. You didn't get any more stuff for it, but you got the down payment already. So what's the full inheritance? Not just your soul saved, not just your soul righteous, all of you righteous, all of you sinless. Like if the down payment was you got the Holy Spirit, then the full payment is you're all holy, just like Jesus Christ. See how that all ties together? Now, verse 14 again, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So verse 7 says we have redemption, present tense. Verse 14 says the redemption is future. So again, our soul is redeemed, but what is not redeemed yet? Our body. Now, what is, what is hindering our relationship to God? What is hindering our relationship to our brothers and sisters in Christ? It's our body. Our body hasn't been redeemed. Our flesh hasn't been redeemed. It is still sinful. It is still corrupt. It still has all the desires it ever did. And that is what's messing up everything the Lord wants to do. That's His eternal purpose. So what's standing in the way of us being just like Jesus Christ? It's our own flesh. It's our own body. Now, so we're redeemed, but we're waiting to be redeemed. Now, let's look at one passage in the Old Testament. Go to Jeremiah 32. So, <clears throat> I hope that made sense. What the Lord began in you is what He it, it is is the beginning of the of the work He's going to do eventually complete. And. What the Lord is saying is, I've given you all these spiritual blessings to be used to make you just like Jesus Christ. So, what are, so in, between, in between the day we got redeemed and the day we will be redeemed, that's what the Lord's focusing on. That's what the Lord's trying to get us to work on in this life. This life is the in-between time of the down payment and the full payment. In between, that's what we're working on right now. And one day, one day you're going to get the full payment. One day your body's going to be redeemed. But if you live after the flesh, it's going to be a rough journey on the way. Now look at Jeremiah 32. 
Jeremiah 32, verse number 6. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalem, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, we, for time's sake, we can't read the first, six verse, first five verses, but the Lord's already told them that they're going, to, in the, they're going into captivity. Jerusalem's going into captivity in Babylon, and now the Lord says, I want you to buy a field. Well, why would you buy a field if you're about to be carried into Babylon? Well, the Lord's telling them, because one day you're coming back. One day you're coming back. And uh, verse number 8 says, So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, By my field I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, for the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even seventeen shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it, and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, and the side of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. So, there's two evidences of the purchase. One is sealed and one is open. One is open for anybody to be read. One is sealed where nobody can see. Now, Hold your finger here. Go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse number 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of His glory. Back up to verse 13, end of the verse. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, in Jeremiah, you have the evidences of the purchase. One evidence is sealed and one is open. Now, we have been redeemed. Our soul has been redeemed. And there is an evidence of the purchase that the Lord bought us. In fact, there's two. We have a sealed evidence that nobody can see. The Holy Spirit sealed, the Lord sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise. There is an evidence inside, inside that is not visible to anyone that we are bought, we are sealed and then, what do we also have? We also have a written record of the fact that the Bible says, if you'd put your trust in the Lord, He would save you. And if you did it, then you're saved. So what do you have? You have a sealed evidence, Holy Spirit inside you. And you have an open evidence that anybody can see and anybody can read. And you're saved because you did what the Bible says. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what your thoughts on the matter is or if you feel saved or you don't feel saved. Did the Bible say, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Yes, it does. Then did you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved? If you did, then you're saved. And that is the evidence right there that anybody can see. And so there's two evidences. There's the sealed and then there's the open. Now, skip to verse 28. In the meantime, before the Lord comes back to redeem what he's already bought, verse 28, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans that fight against this city shall come and set fire on this city, and burn it with the houses, upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal, and pour out drink offerings unto other gods to provoke me. Now, if you read the less... The next several verses, the Lord is des describing in detail all the evils that are going to come upon Jerusalem for their sins. So what do you have? You have a field being purchased, being redeemed, but there's going to be 70 years in the meantime of horrendous judgments upon Jerusalem because of their disobedience. But one day, one day, they're going to come back and return. But it was an awful rough, awful rough road to get there, was it not? Now, verse 43 
It says, And fields shall be bought in this land, whereof ye say it is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the valley and in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. So what's going on, Jeremiah? Jeremiah buys the field. That's evidence, that's promise that one day, although they're about to be carried back in the ba- carried in captivity into Babylon, one day the Lord's going to bring them back into that land. Now, for 70 years, it's, it's horrendous judgments on Jerusalem. They're, the city is burnt with fire. They, are not, they cannot defend themselves. They are in captivity. But one day, one day after 70 years, they're going to come back. But that was an awful hard way to do it, wasn't it? That was an awful hard way to go when if they had just stayed obedient, they could have just been enjoying the blessings of the land the entire time. Now, here's the thing. If you're saved, the Lord has sealed you, He has redeemed you, and no matter what you do, one day He is going to come for you and He is going to make you just like Jesus Christ. No sin, perfect, holy, but... Living after the flesh and disobeying the Lord can make the journey an awful hard road to go into the meantime. And one day the Lord's coming for you, but and it might be tonight, but it could be a long time from now. Now, not long as far as God's concerned, but as far as you and I are concerned, we can make the trip pretty rough, couldn't we? We can make it an awful hard road to get there. Now, wouldn't it be crazy? Wouldn't it be crazy for Israel to say, "Oh, we don't care about obeying the Lord. We don't care about doing his law. He's already told Abraham we're going to get the whole land. Who cares what happens in the meantime? <laughs> Who cares if we get overrun by the Assyrians? Who cares if we get overrun by the Babylonians? Who cares if all our family is separated and our children are killed? Who cares about all that? Who cares if we lose everything? The Bible says one day we'll all be restored." That that was that'd be crazy. No one would say that. They wouldn't say. They wouldn't desire that. They wouldn't like. They wouldn't want that. Well, that's the same thing as a saved person saying, "I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I can live whatever way I want to live." Yes, you can, but you can make it an awful mess on your way to get there. And one day the Lord's going to fulfill His promise. He's going to take you home. You're going to be just like Jesus Christ. But there's a joyful and pleasant way to go. And there's a hard, miserable way to go. And I don't know about you, why would I go through captivity if I didn't have to? Why would, I ha- why would I lose all my joy, all my peace, every blessing in my life if I didn't have to? And look, you're redeemed, your soul is redeemed, and if you're saved, one day your body is going to be redeemed. That's not even up for discussion, it's going to happen. But how about in the meantime? How about in the meantime? The Lord wants to give you an abundant life. You already have life. You already have eternal life. He wants to give you an abundant life in the meantime. And how how is that accomplished? Well, what's the Lord's purpose in you to make you just like Jesus Christ? How can you have the most abundant life on this earth possible? Be just like Jesus Christ. Let the Word of God conform you to the image of His Son as much as possible in this life. So you don't have to be carried into Babylon for 70 years and say, well, one day we're going back. (laughs) Yeah, one day you are going back. One day you are going to be with the Lord. But why not make it a blessed road in the meantime?